taking your piece and just uh, uh, burying it around and you pull it out and you don't have to do it. It's not a lot of people. 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 It's not a lot of people.
he's been active um, on the field of media art uh, for for actually a long time. So I think we could also consider Paul one of the real pioneers on this on this field. Um, Paul has been using uh, many different kinds of technologies uh, in his work, but I think I would say that sound technology, all different aspects of sound technology, also the history of sound has been probably one of the guiding, guiding lines here. And uh, Paul has actually promised to show us, show us also some examples of his very early work to give, give us a, a pers perspective. So, um, um, Paul, just to say a couple of words, so Paul was one of the uh, first artists who um, uh, worked at the uh, Exploratorium in uh, San Francisco where they have had this interesting artist in residence program taking place over the years, which has actually produced much interesting uh, work. Paul has uh, shown work in, in really different parts, parts of the world over the years, and uh, he has also done uh, a lot of um, research on, on early, early media. Uh, early ideas about producing and transmitting sound. Uh, many of them have been totally forgotten over the years. And then um, he's using, used his art practice as a way of like uh, resurrecting those technologies and uh, then bringing them to the, to, the, to the present, combining these things with other, other technologies. And so I think it's an approach which is extremely rich and, and offers many, many kinds of uh, possibility for, possibilities for understanding the role of these, these technologies in, in culture. But uh, without um, any uh, further point, we shall then help you welcome uh, Paul de Marius. Thank you. Well, I suppose since you're a media technology and media history class, you're well aware that our culture is is probably the first um, to really experience its own archaeology um, almost on a daily basis. Um, the, the changes and advances in, in formats and um, media technologies have been so, could you turn that down a little? Um, have been so um, fast that um, we're continually um, bumping into our own archaeology, the archaeology of what we might have done um, 10 years ago. I mean, it already has this archaeological patina to it. And so I thought I would show some of my earlier um, works um, the way that you, in 20 years hence, may be showing your um, students or talking to people and trying to explain what the internet was and why everybody was so excited about it and, and what a web page was. Um, so, <laughs> so I want to show some slides and um, what I'm going to do is show some slides and then uh, and talk over them and kind of explain things and then I'm going to show videos. The video will repeat the same material as the slides but with you know motion and sound um, give you, to give you some more idea of what the pieces actually are. Um, but I can't, it's easier to talk over slides. I don't know what direction to point this in. There. Um, my original, my background is in uh, studying uh, as an undergraduate was in experimental film and music. And I um, studied film with Paul Sheritz, who was one of the structural filmmakers in the 60s. Um, when I went to graduate school, I went to Mills College Center for Contemporary Music, and there I had the good chance to meet um, some of the artists who'd worked with the experiments in art and technology um, with uh, the Cunningham Dance Company. They were composers, David Tudor, Gordon Wilma, and David Behrman, who had all managed to learn some home-built electronic circuits um, in the late 60s and early 70s. So I set out, I, I learned a little bit of of electronic technology from these other artists and kind of set out, everybody was building synthesizers in those days. I set out to build pieces. I got really tired of the idea of making synthesizers, that is a, a instrument to play sound with, like making, inventing a guitar or something. One of the first things I did in 1973 was the Pygmy Gamelon. It was a little box that measured um, about four inches by seven inches, but about an inch high had what were very new devices in those days, LEDs, um, light emitting diodes were absolutely brand new. Um, it used hybrid TTL, digital, and um, analog circuitry. 
um, to read electric fields in its vicinity and respond to them by playing, improvising these little five note melodies. And it had kind of a, a muffled, tinkly sound like a distant gamelan orchestra playing. And it had this kind of pygmy um, improvisational quality of pygmy music. So I called it the pygmy gamelan. My original idea was to make it a replacement for the car radio. So as you drove through uh, the city under power lines and by radio stations. I mean, we're living, it's, it's kind of the bottom feeder. Of, of electromagnetic fields, um, it would respond and play and you could um, just kind of drive through this electronic landscape. I made these circuit boards myself, um, you know, um, with etching them with chemicals and drilling them and this is a view of a later version from I think 1975 of a pygmy gamelan circuit. In 1975, I bought my first computer. It was a Kim One um, microprocessor board, uh, programmed in hexadecimal. It, there wasn't even an assembler; it was machine language, and um, it had it used a 6502 microprocessor running at one megahertz and had one k of RAM. <laughs> and when you're writing, yeah, yeah, when you're when you're writing in machine language, one k is a lot. Um, writing a, a 300 byte program that works um, well in machine language takes some time. So all of that time that we now waste um, or use creatively waiting for our vast megabytes, gigabytes of RAM to be loaded with this enormously obese operating system, I used to spend writing in a cafe as all artists do, my zeros and ones, and then taking it home and trying it out and debugging it. And so this little board was only that big. It, it, when you turned on the power, it came on. Your operating system was running. Um, one of the first things I did with it was a collaboration with um, sculpture, scu sculptor and uh, performance artist Jim Pomeroy um, called A Bite at the Opera. Um, we created this um, stage, a hollow stage, and a platform above. Um, Pomeroy was under the stage on a um, wheeled creeper, one of those dollies you go under your truck with or car to, to do mechanics repairs. And he had a variety of power tools and magnets and syringes full of chalk dust. You may have been there. This, this was at, at, in 1976 at uh, Langton Street. And I was above with my Kim One microprocessor that I had wired the output um, ports, the digital port pins, to loudspeakers. And there were all these loudspeakers in the surface of the, uh, also in this, this surface of the stage. So what we had was, I, I had the, the loudspeakers full of beans, pinto beans and dried garbanzo beans and stuff, so that you could, I, I could by pulsing the pin, kind of like an inkjet printer, I could spit out a bean and or make whole volcanic eruptions by hitting the resonant frequency of the speaker. So I was controlling those and he was underneath using these magnets and power tools to move things around and manipulate the surface. So it was kind of the creation of a painting of a lunar landscape by tectonic forces from below and <laughs> celestial forces from above. At the end of it, um, Pomeroy, with the help of a saber saw, broke out of his, his uh, tectonic prison and rescued me from the platform. So that was an early computer, early application of microprocessors. Um, in 1978, the Speak and Spell came out, the first digital speech synthesizer that was available outside of the military. And I spent a long summer with a teletype and my Kim One hacking its serial bus and getting it to chant and sing. And this is from a concert in 1978 or 79, um, accompanying it with a Japanese percussion instrument playing tropical music. Uh, about the same time, I developed this um, kind of paddle-like instrument that had touch sensors, um, it, capacitive touch sensors on it, and used it to control. I was using, I think, an AIM-65 by then um, with some Casio tones that I'd also hacked. This is way before MIDI. Um, and I taught the computer all these different licks, and I could kind of overlay. I wrote a little simple musical multitasking program so I could overlay all these different licks. and. Um, and this was from, a, I think, 1981 or 82. At, uh, I don't know if you were around at San Francisco Union Square performance. 
Um, I found my son, who was little then, playing this, stuff, this instrument as well as I could. And then I, uh, it, I was invited to the Exploratorium to do something by Frank Oppenheimer. And he said, oh, why don't you, you know, come and do a piece? And so I decided to turn this into this kind of electric guitar idea with these capacitive touch sensors. By this time, um, I was using an Apple II um, with 48K of RAM running fourth, which was a, a powerful enough language to write a program with some real musical intelligence so that people could have these separate musical instruments. Each one could play a part, but it would do all kinds of corrections on the fly when they played together to keep them in tune and in time. And so this piece was called The Music Room. It was at the Exploratorium for quite a long time. Is it still there? No, they took it down, I don't know, about six or seven years ago. And it's been, an, it was like bought by other children's museums and stuff. I tried, well, um, it, it got some news. <laughs> it was sufficiently high profile enough that when the brother of, of King Fod came to San Francisco, this made AP wire photo and people sent it to me from all over the world. Um, the swinging Saudi, yeah. Um, unfortunately, it was during Ramadan, and as this uh, excerpt from People magazine shows, um, it was, didn't make very good press back in Saudi Arabia that he was, during Ramadan, he was out playing guitar, electric guitar in a disco. Um, I went to Japan in 1982 to try to sell the system. I talked to Casio and Yamaha and um, uh, another Sony. And nobody wanted this idea of the automatic music guitar. But like 10 years later, these kinds of things were, were uh, lost leaders at places like Target. Yeah, I don't think anybody ever made money on it. But anyway, artist's invention. Um, I started doing uh, these, these pieces with um, um, a hacked Mattel power glove. I threw away all the ultrasound stuff because it wasn't reliable enough in a, in a performance situation where you're ha you had sound coming back from loudspeakers. And I increased the resolution of the flex fingers, uh, the finger flex sensors to eight bits. So I, I made a bunch of songs based on the way that people talk, the natural rise and fall of, of language. And I'll just play a little bit. Who was doing the computer? Can you just, yeah, put on track three. I just put a little bit of it on for the first 30 seconds or so to give you an idea. Um, yeah, I'm following the, the um, prosody, the patterns of, of rhythm and uh, melody of voices. And um, I could resynthesize these with um, my, I made a, a speech synthesizer that I could control. And they were coordinated over a MIDI connection. Um, a piece I did at Ars Electronica, a kind of autobiographical piece uh, called An Unsettling Matter, um, treats my uh, childhood experiences in eastern Nevada during the era of uh, atmospheric atomic testing. Um, the, the gallery had, uh, I, I made these um, slide projections with five slide projectors of desert sunrises and sunsets um, that were panoramically projected. And there was a small um, playhouse made of lead. Um, and it was uh, perforated with these windows that were from slides that my father took during uh, the 50s when we were living in Nevada. There he is with his Geiger counter out in 
the middle of the desert and um, me and my mom kind of looking into nowhere. Um, <clears throat> inside was a Geiger counter and a radio and um, I made a lot of material, stories from my family, stories from other people, uh, music from that, that time and sounds from the desert and transmitted it all from tape onto um, different radio stations. And um, it was so, so you could tune through and get all this different material. Um, the other thing was, oops, let me go back. Um, on the floor of the gallery, whoops, well, now I'm lost, I'm out of focus. On the floor of the gallery is this, I, I put this acrylic powder. It was uh, 15, I put 15 pounds of this sparkly powder that they use for metallic flake finishes and cars and stuff. And it, it's utterly harmless, unlike the plutonium that was wafting through the desert when I was a kid. Um, but it's um, very, very visible. And so as people would go in, they'd um, get contaminated with it. And they'd give, take it home and give it to their children. And by the uh, end of the first day, this was in the Bruckner Hall in Linz, the whole gallery, the whole Bruckner Hall was um, completely covered with this powder. And by the end of the week of the exhibition, um, you could go anywhere in the city of Linz and see people had little sparkles on them. <laughs> and people who'd never even heard of Ars Electronica and never been there, it just spread um, like a contamination. And it was still there, Woody Vasilka told me it was still there the next year and um, the, the cleaning people absolutely hated it. <laughs> anyway, so that was an unsettling matter. Um, about the same time I started this uh, piece called The Edison Effect um, and made a bunch of pieces that play older impossible phonograph records with lasers. Um, here a portrait, a self-portrait a self as it were of Thomas Edison with his trademark name written all over it from a, a phonograph cylinder um, holder. Um, this is from an installation that I did at the San Francisco Art Institute in 1993. Um, each of the pedestals has a different piece that's kind of a discourses upon phonography, memory as it relates to, to memory, um, perception of music and time, um, the object, of the phonograph record and so forth. Um, and up on the balcony is this same image of Edison that's projected in such a way um, that when you move from one side of the gallery to the other below, it turns from positive to negative. Um, the whole installation is illuminated with DC, direct current lights, um, in uh, keeping with Edison's DC patents and in opposition to the, the Tesla Westinghouse. Um, patents on AC that we still live with now. Um, largely because the uh, pieces are very sensitive to alternating current light, light that's turning on and off. For instance, you know, those fluorescents behind there are turning on and off 120 times a second or, or a video monitor is flashing at you 60 times a second. You're, you're probably 90% of your mental energy when you're looking at a video monitor or in a room with fluorescent lights. Uh, goes to trying to stitch together this this blinking impression that you have, which is probably why TV is so engaging, because it really uses your brain. Um, um, so one of the pieces um, is shown here schematically. It's called Al and Mary Do the Waltz. It plays an Edison wax cylinder from the turn of the last century um, here that um, spins around on a paint roller with a rubber band and a little motor. Um, and there's this part of a virus injection machine that was some surplus from Cetus Corporation um, that moves a mirror back and forth and a lens and a photo detector so that a laser beam coming from the other side um, is focused as a spot in the groove of this turning cylinder. The reflections come back um, to the photo detector and are turned into sound and it plays the music in the groove. Um, in the way, there's a bowl of goldfish. This is a cylinder of the Blue Danube Waltz, by the way, um, by Strauss. There's a bowl of goldfish and so this record, it never gets worn out, it plays endlessly, except when the fish swim through and interrupt the beam so there's no reading spot um, on it. So I'll show a video of it later on. 
The fish seem to always get into um, playing with the, the laser beam. I think because they're red fish, they like to wag their tails through the, through the beam and make a big red flash of light. I think it makes them feel bigger. Um, this one's called uh, Rondo in Blue a la Cold Turkey. Here the laser is a diode semiconductor laser. It's coming out of a hypodermic syringe that is kind of jerked around erratically on a, on a tone arm controlled by a little microprocessor. And it plays an old 78 record of uh, it's Oscar Levant, the hipster among the original Hollywood squares um, and virtuoso pianist, boyhood friend of George Gershwin playing Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. And this piece plays around and it plays the label and it plays the surface of the record and the edge and it plays just about everything except the music. Uh, but it plays a little bit of the music now and then too. Kind of referring to the addictive qualities of listening to. When you listen to a record, you know, that you put the needle in the groove or something that has a forward directionality like a CD, that there's this implied direction. You start at one place and you play it through to the end. Um, it has this kind of addictive quality, whereas with a laser, there's only light touching the groove um, and there's no directionality built into the digital codes like on the CD, so it's completely analog, random access. You can play it any way you want. You can play what, what, hear what was intended to be heard or you can hear all these other noises that are part of the object. Um, as soon as the phonograph was invented in the 1870s, people had the idea that there may be or may have been an accidental sound recording, um, something made by accident, maybe as a potter was turning his wares in the market in Babylon and, um, you know, finishing some wet clay pot with a feather and a cow bellowed or somebody called out a name and that this may have been buried somewhere, this, this ancient thing. Um, the idea, this idea, is, people have been having this idea um, since the 1870s. Um, I decided to put an end to the matter and, and fabricate this ancient device. Um, and so I made this piece called Fragments of Jericho. Um, I made a device for engraving an analog soundtrack into the surface of wet clay. Uh, it, it wasn't, I don't think it would have happened accidentally. Um, maybe a specially talented voice like Jesus talking to a especially weak person like Lazarus, you know, something, somebody, you know, so feeble as to be very impressionable, you know, get up, man, go to work, you know, life's not so bad, you know, the old self-help uh, pep talk. Maybe, some, maybe it could have happened, but I had to go through about 20 iterations of my design to actually get one that could play. Um, what I got back, I was, I was doing this through a uh, kind of hobby clay store. Um, and I'd go in every week with a few of the, get, pick up a few of these wet pots and take a few back to get baked. And the woman said, are you doing some kind of science experiment? And you probably know this. You're always getting this out. Yeah, I'm doing some science education for children. You can get away with anything <laughs> on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so I, I broke the, this white um, bisque clay pot and antiqued parts of it. Um, and kept some parts out as the, the white un, un antique parts to look like restorations because in museums they use plaster restorations for like old pots. And my wife very um, devotedly at that point in our relationship put it back together and uh, <laughs> glued it back together and there's this artifact. So if you, uh, there's, there's this big black knob that just turns a mirror and there's a little laser and you can direct it onto different grooves and I recorded voices in it, ancient voices. Um, things that sounded to me like ancient voices. I used like um, pygmies talking and I used um, uh, these Gaelic laments that were recorded in the 1930s, sad songs. I used Hindi movie dialogues, um, things like that, Vedic chants. And so you can kind of pick out that there's this voice talking in some language that you don't understand. And uh, you, sometimes people think that it is their own language. And here you can see a close-up of the groove where the striation, the distance between the striations is the frequency of the wave. How fast are the five? Oh, I did a, four, it's 45. They're singles, yeah. 45 <laughs> RPM. <laughs> um, when I was doing all, all of the, this is with the, was in the early 90s, and um, I was playing, you know, doing these pieces, and I, 
taught, was giving a talk to some optical physicists who were assembled at the Exploratorium. And I said, do you think you could play, you know, since I could play a record with a laser, it seemed to me I should be able to play a hologram of a record with a laser. And, you know, physicists scratch their heads and say, well, yes, theoretically it's possible, but you couldn't really make it work. So I have these friends in Santa Fe who are artist holographers. I mean, they're artists who have a hol holography lab. And so I went there and camped out on their floor for a couple of weeks, and we made some holograms of play. So here it is, the beer barrel polka, uh, a, a hologram of a 78 of the beer barrel polka that gets played with the laser. So there's no needle and there's no groove, and the music still plays. Um, it's called Ich auch Berliner, kind of in homage to uh, uh, Emil Berliner, the man who invented the flat disc, and to Irving Berlin, who said he wrote the beer barrel polka, but actually bought it the rights for $40 from a Czech accordionist. And, of course, John Kennedy, whose famous gaff, Berlin Wall. Anyway, this is an, another piece with a hologram. You can see it's a thick glass plate. Um, I took a 78 of Ravel's Bolero, the piece that goes on almost forever, and made it into a piece that really does go on forever. Um, there's a little microprocessor controlled uh, servo motor that um, moves, can move between, quickly between the different tracks and kind of cut and paste together bits of bolero so that it really just is endless and obnoxious as can be. Um, so anyway, this one's called Unraveled Melody. Um, another piece in reference to my nuclear childhood, um, uh, Loving, Dying, the Unrequited Quark, plays a old 78 of the, the Liebestod, the love death scene from Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. And it, uh, there's an old supermarket scanner laser up there and this sled that moves back and forth with the optics and the photo detector. Very it moves very, it has a very fine screw so it moves, can move very slowly. And it moves one little, advances one little notch over a, fr a, a fraction of a groove every time a gamma ray is detected by the, uh, the uh, Geiger counter. And there's a piece of uranium positioned up there such that when the love-death climax is approached, it achieves normal speed. So you recognize what the music is. When it's out at the periphery, um, the prelude, it's just uh, kind of slow Wagnerian chords moving through anyway. And the sound comes out of a cheap guitar practice amp, as it should. So here you can see the, uh, you can see kind of the setup. Here's uh, the laser beam. I, I blew some smoke through it. I won't say where the smoke came from. Um, I blew some smoke through so you can see the laser beam goes, comes out of the laser, gets focused by a lens onto a first surface mirror down onto a spot on the turning record and then it gets picked up by a amplified photo detector. Huh. <clears throat> Another piece I did in the same, the same exhibition in 1993 was called Fireflies Light on the Abacus of Al-Farabi and it's a 60 foot long vibrating music wire with a green laser pointing right over it and little dancing loops of monofilament that when they jump up into the laser beam disclose a point of green light. And I'll show a video of it. It's a kinetic and sound piece. Um, so this is just a time exposure. Um, I was an artist in residence at Xerox Park in Palo Alto for about four years. And they had these enormous, I was working with the ubiquitous computing uh, group of Mark Weiser first, but then I, I started working with some of the printer people and um, they had these printers that could print out fantastic things and they all run PostScript inside. And since PostScript is a lot like Forth, which I used back in the early 80s, I started writing some PostScript programs to make, to design soundtracks. And let's see if I've got the slide. Yeah. Um, what I did was I pushed several megabytes of audio onto the stack of the printer and then popped it off to um, determine the width of the line. And I don't know if any of you have ever looked at film soundtracks, but this is basically a variable area film soundtrack, um, where it's, it's really a, quite a direct representation of the, the wave. Um, so I'm, I had this silk screened onto ceramic plates, um, and they sit on a small table 
Um, they're played with a tone arm made of some chopsticks that's controlled by a servo motor inside the table. And there are these little sushi-sized pieces of circuit board that hold a diode laser and a photo detector so they can play the uh, track on there. They track across. And um, I selected four clips from um, Bernard Herrmann's score for Hitchcock's Vertigo. Um, <laughs> Because they kind of have this hypno disc roto relief kind of, you know, look to them. They have this this nasty hypnotic illusory look. So um, it seemed appropriate. So it's called, the piece is called Dinner at Ernie's. Ernie's being the restaurant in San Francisco where Kim Novak and Jimmy Stewart meet up in the film. Um, another kind of impossible record player. I was interested in beeswax because it was one of the original. Um, analog preservation methods. Um, before it was used in early phonograph record formulations, it was used by ancient Egyptian perfumers to capture the essences of flowers by putting flowers on beeswax. It, it'll suck in their, their aromatic essences. So it kind of is a, a, a most ancient of analog recorders. So I made these uh, beeswax records with flower petals in them. And the player is a wooden beehive with different drawers having different records. And again, they're played by a laser. Um, I had to make a machine to cut beeswax records with a special bamboo needle and uh, cutting head so it didn't stick because you couldn't use a regular. I had to invent all kinds of machines to make the things, the media. Um, yeah, and there it is in a, another setting. Um, another uh, record, kind of impossible record I made is part of a, a bigger project called the Lecture of Comrade Stalin. Um, I found this set of, of phonograph records of Stalin from the 1930s when I was in Estonia and bought them and have done a bunch of different pieces with them. But what I did is re-recorded on a lacquer disc and I computer modified the sound file in such a way as to modify the phase so that when you look at the record obliquely and the, the light is at the right angle, you see Stalin's face written by his own words. Um, so there he is. And I just you know, Xeroxed the label from the original and pasted it on. Um, another piece I made while I was at Park, I got asked to do a piece for the Technorama Museum in Switzerland for a textile show. Um, that was being sponsored by this high-tech um, loom, computerized loom company. So I made this piece called Singer of Songs. Um, I converted an old uh, treadle Singer sewing machine with a Xerox printer drum um, that turns, and on it I put this piece of cloth um, that has, again, soundtracks like uh, movie optical soundtracks. By sliding this handle along, you can select different tracks with a laser beam. And I put on, like, you know, I put on a xylophone scale, I put in car crashes, bits of Elvis, uh, shrieks. So it's kind of the original sampler. You can, you know, transpose things up and down in pitch by treadling faster or slower. <laughs> and you can access and cut among the, the different sounds. And here you can see the close up of the woven cloth with the soundtrack in it. So I did, I wrote a postscript file to, do, to generate a GIF, and I just sent them a GIF, and they could weave the GIF on their, on their loom. Um, in 1995, I started a project called Gray Matter, based on the work of the American inventor, Alicia Gray, who is mostly remembered today as the man who almost invented the telephone. He um, applied for a patent for precisely the same device that Alexander Graham Bell did on the same day, um, but five hours later. And so Bell got precedence. There's speculation as to whether Bell's was actually later and there was some connivance going on in the patent office, but anyway, that's the dirty side of history is endless. Um, but the interesting thing to me about Gray is how he got to the telephone. Um, the telephone involved um, taking a, an acoustic signal, turning it into an electrical signal, and then turning it back to an acoustic signal because electricity can travel very um, fast without too much degradation. Um, this, for, in 1874, in the Scientific American, he published an article describing his musical bathtub. And this was the first device um, 
or one of the very first devices for turning electrical vibrations into sound vibrations. And he did it by rubbing his hand, which he held on to a, a high, high voltage, high frequency coil, and rubbed his hand against the interior of a zinc bathtub. Um, and, and the sound that came out was the same frequency as the vibration of the electrical field. So this is really the first kind of, of electrical to audio transducer. Um, I did some pieces based on, on this phenomenon. I discovered this phenomenon independently about 102 years after Gray did. In 1976, when I was working on another piece, I noticed it and I said, hmm, what's that? Maybe I could do something with that. And then when I started reading about Gray, I was reading about Bell to do a piece about the telephone, and um, I started learning about Gray. I realized I knew immediately what this was because um, I experienced it. And you experience it um, probably if you, uh, especially in the United States, Europeans never know about this phenomenon because everything's very well grounded in Europe. But um, here we have unbalanced power. So a lot of times if you go up to your toaster and rub your knuckles over it, you kind of feel, like, feel a buzzing 60 cycle buzz. And that's this phenomenon. It, what, basically what it's doing is modulating the um, coefficient of friction of your skin. So it's electricity acting on your the, your the biology of your cells instantaneously. So it's this kind of stick and slip phenomenon. You know, like if you bow a violin, it's the little horse hair sticking and then slipping and releasing the string, kind of pulling it, letting it go. Well, this can be done with an electric field. So I made these pieces that do that with an electrical field. Um, this one, called gray matter, uses an, an old Victorian zinc bathtub and a double base and they're strung together with uh, these brass harpsichord wires. And by either rubbing your knuckles along the inside of the tub or stroking the electrified strings, you can bring forth the sound of somebody um, practicing major scales on the cello. Um, and here are people doing, you get a little bit of a shock, but it's um, <laughs> all in the interest of art, you know. Um, this one, <laughs> yeah, I always like that tall, skinny people get shocked the worst. It seems some kind of poetic justice. Um, here, this piece, solo for two, has two violins strung together with four wires between them, and it plays a uh, Bach partita. Um, it's, it's a detail. And this one, stuck and slip, makes eerie kind of creaking door sounds. There's the electrified toaster and a hollow door. So there are no loudspeakers. It's just your skin um, getting shocked that makes the, the music. And some other pieces I did, um, so when people uh, complain about um, uh, you know, the shock, I tried doing it with fruit, and uh, it works with the um, citrus skin, too. So I made these pieces called Still Life with Musical Instrument. This uh, did Still Life with Guitar. This is Still Life with Lyre. Yeah? How do you touch the string to the fruit? You rub. You pick up a piece of fruit, and you rub it oh, along oh, the strings. No, no, you have to rub it. And the, the amount of force that you put uh, controls the loudness of the sound. Because the, 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 the energy for the sound is not coming from the electrical field, which is very weak. It's coming from the, the it's transducing this force by interrupting the energy, the, the kinetic motion, putting, turning the, the kinetic energy into stored energy alternately and releasing it as kinetic energy. Um, in 1875, Gray got one step closer to the uh, telephone, and um, this is before Bell had conceived of anything like this, using electromagnets in a, a wash basin. And so um, it's, it was always interesting to me, the uh, thing about Gray is that he, where, where Bell was kind of coming as a tutor to the deaf, um, teaching um, visible speech and teaching hand speech to, the, to, to usually wealthy deaf students in their fancy Victorian parlors. Gray was in the bathroom um, with things like chamber pots and bathtubs. And you wonder when you think of the domestic sighting of telecommunications equipment today, um, if he'd maybe beaten a little bit faster um, pace to the patent office, if our telecommunications might not be centered domestically in the bathroom along with pipes and vents and stuff instead of in the parlor where it is 
or whatever inherits the parlor. So I made some, this piece called um, a music lesson that's a um, dialogue between a puppet, Hurvinek, and his, his violin teacher um, with these two talking bowls using this principle. And another piece, Souvenir of Mataram, uses a dancing horseshoe wound as an electromagnet to um, play Indonesian techno music over on an Indonesian food bowl. Um, <laughs> kind of dances around in time with the music. It's held from a fishing uh, pole. Um, a piece I did called Grind Snakes, Blind Apes, a study for Pomeroy's tomb is um, kind of musingly dedicated to uh, artist Jim Pomeroy, with whom I collaborated in the 70s in that uh, piece of Bite at the Opera. He died in 1992. Um, I had to pack up all his junk. Um, his parents, I guess I was the only per friend of his they remembered, and asked me to pack up his stuff. So I had to go to Texas and get like 500 packing boxes. And so this piece kind of reflects those packing boxes. Uh, in order to make a light baffle, I, I did this installation with, with these packing boxes. Inside is a um, kind of primate lab cage um, with this mechanism inside. And what the mechanism does is it writes in a phosphorescent surface an image or images of Jim Pomeroy with a light that's computer controlled. So the light charges up the phosphorescent material pixel by pixel. Um, it's controlled, the, the light is held by a monkey's paw that moves back and forth and draws pixel by pixel on the slowly rotating drum to create the uh, faces of Pomeroy. And since it's a machine, um, it takes about five minutes to scan and the, the face is already fading. I cropped an image of smiling Jim Pomeroy, kind of like a have a happy day face. And it's repeated first as twos and then threes and fours and fives. And the sound of the piece is, a, I'll show a video of it, is a, uh, the droning of the motor and the snoring of Jim Pomeroy that he recorded for a piece he did at MoMA in the 1980s. <clears throat> um, another piece, The Messenger, is based on the work of Francesc Salva, an 18th century Catalan scientist who was um, one of the very first people to propose using electricity to send messages. Um, I did this piece in Barcelona in a, in a gallery at Gallery Metronome that used to be the Saffron Bourse in the 19th century where people traded saffron and has these beautiful windows. Um, Salva's proposals in the 18th century um, for a telegraph um, kind of belie all the, the, the common assumptions about telecommunications in society that are, that are proffered by um, people ranging from, uh, well, I mean, George W. Bush, for instance, um, said a few months ago, about democracy in China that we didn't have to worry about it because they're getting the internet there and pretty soon there'll be democracy as though um, telecommunications just, uh, you know, wherever they go, um, democracy follows and free trade and all of those things. Um, Salva making his proposals before the French Revolution um, kind of show that isn't quite the case. In fact, his first proposal for a telegraph was involved no two-way communication whatsoever. It was one way from the manor house to the servants' quarters or from Madrid to Havana um, with 26 wires, one for each letter of the alphabet. A Leyden jar, the only source of electricity then, a high voltage spark would be discharged over each wire. Uh, at the reception side would be a servant waiting for a shock. Upon feeling their their shock, they would call out their letter of the alphabet, presumably illiterate people. And a 27th person would be there to write down um, the message. Um, a later proposal used frog's legs. Um, and then finally, after the French Revolution, he proposed using the decomposition of water, electrical decomposition of water, to make hydrogen to, as a letter indicator, which would be politically correct even today. Still no idea of two-way communication, no idea of free exchange, no idea of democracy in telecommunications technology. So for my piece, I used some of, more of these talking bowls a la Elisha Gray. Each one says a different letter of the alphabet. Um, and the messages they're reading are just my email. I just um, have a computer connected to the net and all of my email gets read. Um, here's bowl A, B, C, D, and so on around to Z. 
and they, they read my email one letter a second. Um, there's an, a second telegraph is a set of dancing skeletons that are solenoid controlled, so they spell, each one has a little poncho on it, so they jump up when their letter is signaled, they get jerked around, and uh, there are L and M. And then there's a set of uh, winking electrolytic jars. And I'll show a video of these things. So they're like these pickled letters. And each one kind of winks and lets off bubbles of hydrogen when it's signaled. Uh, I'm going to go by this. Just one other piece I want to show, because I want to show video of it, is a piece I did, a public art project I did for the Expo in Lisbon that uses, I invented this nozzle that uh, transduces sound into water so that when you um, put a resonating membrane, such as an umbrella, under a stream of water, you hear it becomes a loudspeaker. And I'll, if we have time, I'll show some video of this too. So anyway, what I want to do is put on the video. How much time do we have? Are we out of time? Uh, I think we have, yes. I've got about 12 minutes of video. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> Sounds and the shadow. Oh, yeah, I didn't show that. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what was that about? Did you, oh. Is it too hard to talk about it? Yeah, that, that listened to sounds in an environment list, and recorded their spectra and then played back white noise through a changing, a fading filter, a cross fading filter, white noise filtered, so to kind of give replications of their spectra. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So this is the Edison effect. Let me just get some water. Does the sound go through here? Where's the sound button? Okay. okay.
I'll, t I'll, I'll tell you later.
Okay, that's it for So if you have any questions to Paul, so I think we we have time to take a couple of okay. couple of questions. Any anything I so I think what we what we have CD seen is also is both conceptually and, and technically very exceptional. Kind of work. So you you had a question. So uh, technically speaking, uh, for this last piece you were showing in Barcelona, um, would it be possible to have another umbrella underneath, like the the off spray from one of the first umbrellas that was underneath, it and still have the the sound play? Um, I don't I don't know. I never tried it, but uh, we have to it, continue a stream. Once the pattern is disrupted, all you have is. Yeah, I would think it would. I, I don't think it would work, but I'll try it. Let's see. <laughs> so can you hand the? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Is the uh, the water drizzle? Is it pulsating and releasing the water at a certain rates well, or um, pattern? Or what? It's it's uh, the 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 patent is about to be um, released. Uh, so I will, until until I've got the number on the patent. I, I, <laughs> I'm not going to talk too much about it, but basically, um, the idea is that a stream of water um, coming out of a faucet or whatever is not really a stream. It's made up of droplets because of the surface tension of water. And by playing with that, I can encode information into that energy of the stream of water. If you look at a stream of water under a strobe light, I mean, this is an old science museum experiment. You can see that it's really, it looks like a stream of pearls just falling at a very regular rate. So, so the trick is to change that regularity. So we can expect funnels from uh, big corporation buildings to play know. music when we walk <laughs> underneath them with yeah. umbrellas? <laughs> Maybe. I hope so. Give slogans and commercials? <laughs> So were those umbrellas just completely normal, everyday umbrellas? Well, they were, were they made extra heavy duty. They were made by an a umbrella company in London that makes, specializes in like high class umbrellas. And they were designed, this, the polka dot design was designed by a designer who was working for the architect. So, I mean, they were, but, but they, besides being exceptionally durable umbrellas with strong aluminum frames so they could be used for six months, they're ordinary, you know, a regular cheap umbrella will work. Yeah, I was, I was curious about your uh, patents, too. I was wondering how many, how many things you actually do have patented. Um, I copyright everything. I uh, usually, okay, for software things, a copyright is, uh, you know, all the, uh, unless you've got some, unless you're a corporation. And it's, patents are very expensive. So this is the only one I've done because it's something, um, you know, that would be easily, it's, it's easy to see how it's done, yeah, it's very, but very hard to think of. <laughs> so, and also, you know, I mean, other things probably don't have any, I mean, picture records probably in this day and age don't have any, um, you know, market to, it has to be, you don't patent something unless you're going to make at least 10 times back the cost of the patent per year on it. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Can, can you just talk a little bit about your process and your, because it seems like every piece has a kind of research and mechanical, yeah. technological. And yeah, yeah, I do research in a lot of my, not all of the pieces have research, have, have that kind of research, archival research and stuff, but a lot of them do. 
and that informs the, a lot of the detail of the work. But also there's, I always end up after I do a project with a lot of stuff that doesn't find its way into the piece and that usually takes the form of an essay and if anybody's interested in these pieces um, at my website which is well.com forward slash tilde de marini, no s, um, you can read the essays for a lot of the pieces that kind of have the leftovers um, or all the, the interesting stuff that came out in the process of researching it. Um, so that's like the kind of like historical or, or you know media history research and then there's the um, actual technological research that I carry out at my extensive laboratories in, <laughs> in my one bedroom apartment in the Haight-Ashbury. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean you know I devised that thing in the bathtub um, yeah, the, the, the water thing. Um, so, yeah, um, I do some reading. Um, one of the most interesting things, I, I think, was when I was going to get the patent on it, was doing patent archive research. Because there's a wealth of wonderful ideas, things that went nowhere um, out there, especially the 1970s. It's very, very rich with, you know, I found all these fluidic devices and stuff. Fluidic computers were going to be the thing of the future. Um, so there's there's a lot there's so so much um, that's been invented and um, never became anything. And all the stories in it are are really incredible. And the implicit social relationships that every technology um, has that accompany it. Um, it's well that's that's a great literature to look at. You asked a question about the monkey's paw. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, I was making this piece. I had to make this piece in a hurry. I won this prize, and they were having a show at the San Jose Museum, and I had a month to make the piece, and I knew what I wanted to do, and I was spent so much time researching, you know, like the, the light source and the computerization and all of that stuff that um, when it came time for the monkey's paw, I went over to this place called the Bone Room in Berkeley, which kind of sells bones and... Mm -hmm. You know, kind of for, yeah, for, yeah, strange things for collectors. And the guy brought out of his deep freeze these two monkey arms, frozen, that he'd gotten from a monkey that had lived in the zoo that died. And I looked at them and I thought two things. One is this poor monkey lived its whole life in the zoo and, you know, and the other was I didn't want to learn taxidermy in two weeks, you know, and have this thing stink. So I found this, um, a woman, Lauren Abrams, who does uh, models for Lucasfilm. She does precise miniature models for all kinds of things, who had some time and was really nice. And I just hired her to make this. We designed this monkey's paw. And um, she used Wookiee fur on it. That fur is real Wookiee fur. <laughs> so it's even animal rights activist approved. It's totally synthetic. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I looked at that thing of the monkey, you know, doing it, and I thought taxidermy mm, could smell really bad if you don't do it right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and let me let, let me. Oh, was there was there if we, if, you're, if there's a, another question, so we can we can take that one and then get the last one. Um, a lot of your stuff seems very technically oriented as well as like artistically oriented. How did you like come to that, and have you had to like broad training in all kinds of different fields or you just kind of search it out yourself? I mean, I don't know. I mean, months. I kind of grew the, the, the time. I mean, like when I was, you know, in high school, everybody had to take a lot of science. And when I was a kid, I was into science. My father was a scientist. and I used to go down to the lab and hang out on weekends and stuff. So a lot of that is imagery for me. I was, but I never studied. Um, I mean, after high school, I never took, I don't think I ever took a science class. I just did, you know, music and film and arts and literature and stuff that's um, but it was pretty easy to pick up and like I was saying before I, the first lessons I had in electronics were from other artists and I think that's really great because a lot of times I've had students who decided they really wanted to learn you know computer programming for real and would go over to the computer science department either they come back two weeks later saying they never want to do anything with a computer again or they never come back and they become computer scientists so I think it's really good to learn learn your technology from, from other artists. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's embodied in an in a artistic way. 
So, okay, so yeah. thank you, Paul. And uh, sure. to end up with, I would like to um, inform everyone that uh, Paul will have an exhibition at the uh, Art Center College of Design here in Pasadena in the autumn, so opening in, in September. Oh, is it September? I think, I think oh, I thought it was when October. Is it? October. <laughs> I think it's October. It better be October because I've been making my I think schedule. I'll probably, I'll, yeah, I think it's, yes, I think, I think it's October why, sorry, 21st or so. It's October, or so. you are right. Yeah. In October, so we'll, uh, we'll actually pass an information about that. So you'll be, you'll have a chance to actually try quite a few of this, these things you've seen in the, in the slides and the videos there. So, uh, so that's in October. So then, okay, so thanks, Paul. And, uh, okay, well, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks.